Mayor Stix? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Weirich? Here. Council Member Blatz? Here. Council Member Francina? Here. Uh, thank you, Gail. And uh, will you please lead us in the pledge? Councilman Haney? Oh, is I'm so all in. I'm so sorry. And, and I also, I didn't hear, um, was Council Member Francina present? I'm present. Oh, thank you. I couldn't hear you. Sorry. No. Now, uh, now we do the pledge. Just sat down. All right. Again, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Uh, may we have an approval of the agenda? Motion? Uh, yeah, so moved. Are we going to handle the one requester and continuing when we get there? I when would they... recommend handling it as you approve the agenda, just so it's taken care of up front. Okay. Quick question. Uh, out of the closed session, Matt, did you report anything? I don't think I ever heard anything. Uh, no, thank you, Councilmember Blatz. The City Council met closed session to consider the water litigation and took no reportable action. Thank you. So do we uh, want to go ahead and remove the item number six from the agenda at this time? Yes, please. Okay, so I'll make that motion. Okay, thank you. Second? And maybe for the members of the public, we should say what that is in case any, uh, we should describe what item six is in case someone here okay. is waiting to speak. It's the, um, the earth friendly management. Right. Um, and, and, why are, and why are we pulling it? Because um, we want to, we, we need some, we discovered some flaws and we need more, we need to study it more. That's why we're pulling it. And, and, and James did alert everyone yesterday that we were pulling it. He sent out an email. So this should not be a surprise. So can we bring it back it. at the end of the meeting and, and put it in a, on a proper agenda? Um, when we get the future agenda, right. I, when the majority of us yeah. um, want to review it again. Okay. Yes, it will be in the future. Yeah, right. And also we figured it's been a long night starting at 530. There were, there were lots of reasons. So are you seconding the motion? Yes, I'm seconding. Or okay. Unless the mayor already did. No. All in favor? Or Aye. 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 Okay, great. Thank you. All right, uh, we are moving on to presentations, and so I'm going to hand this off to James. Thank you, James. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thanks for handing it off. Um, normally, the the mayor does these, but since uh, we're down here, I, I'll take it. I'll take on duties here. Um, so uh, I think uh, the public has probably heard, and the, and the city council's heard uh, about a uh, a fire on July 30th here uh, outside of the. Um, uh, between the arts center and the park. And uh, the, if you haven't heard about it, the reason you probably didn't is because it was stopped and um, put out very quickly uh, by one of our own uh, police officers, uh, Deputy Ramon Casas. And so uh, we wanted to uh, 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 thank him for his actions uh, here tonight at this meeting. We wanted to present him uh, with a, a commendation and one of our uh, uh, centennial coins. And so we are going to, um, to do that tonight, but, uh, to do that, I want to hand it off to chief Rivera, who's going to say some, some words. So with that, uh, chief. Mayor six council members and staff. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come before you to, uh, talk about this, uh, incident. Um, the city has always been great recognizing folks for their, uh, actions to promote goodwill and to enhance our communities. And tonight is no different, but I'm very proud that we are recognizing one of my own deputies here. Deputy Ramon Casas is 11 year veteran with the Sheriff's Office. He, has, he was assigned to the Ojai Police Station for approximately five and a half years. On the evening of July 30th at about 10.50 p.m., Deputy Casas was patrolling the city when he noticed a very large plume of smoke and hot embers that were rising up above several buildings near Levy Park. Deputy Casas quickly responded to the park and discovered a large palm tree that was fully engulfed in flames. He also saw a subject who was frantically waving his arms and kicking dirt on the palm tree. This subject tried to run into the flames, 
uh, to save some of his personal belongings, but Deputy Costas quickly grabbed him and pulled him to safety. The fire quickly grew and began to spread towards some adjacent homes and some commercial buildings. Deputy Costas grabbed his fire extinguisher from his patrol car and used it to slow the spread of the fire until fire department was able to arrive and extinguish the fire. There is no doubt if it wasn't for Deputy Costas' uh, sharp observations and quick response to action that this fire would have quickly spread to the adjacent commercial and residential buildings, causing significant damage and endangering residents. Deputy Costas' actions also saved the subject who was near the fire from sustaining serious injuries by pulling him out of harm's way. I am very proud of Deputy Costas and the actions he took that night. I'm also very proud of the deputies who patrol our communities day in and day out, uh, every day and every night to ensure the safety of everyone in the Ojai Valley. A special thanks to Laura uh, Bushman and Riley Brown, who took the photographs. I think they're, I don't know if they were going to show them, but they took photographs that were featured on the Ojai Valley News. Uh, one of the photographs was a, a picture, a silhouette of Deputy Costas holding the fire extinguisher, uh, racing over toward the fire to, to slow the spread of that fire. So thank you very much for your time. And you're, uh, I'm very grateful for the, uh, for the acknowledgement of the deputy. Thank you. And, uh, and with, with that, uh, this, uh, I have a, here a City of Ojai commendation where the City Council commends and thanks Deputy Costas for his, his uh, calm bravery and quick response in uh, preventing the uh, fire on July 30th, 2021. So I'm going to give that to Deputy Costas. Thank you. And uh, we have here a, a very limited edition. We only had uh, a few of these made for special occasions like today. Uh, one of our centennial uh, coins uh, that uh, includes our special 100th anniversary logo on the back side. So if, we're also presenting that to you. And uh, 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 Deputy Cass Cassis will like to say a few words. Just real quick, I'll make this real quick. Good evening. Just wanted to say that everything that we do here is 100% a team effort. It wasn't just me that night. It was a lot of the people that behind here in the tan and green as well. They work with me on a nightly basis as well as up here. And without their support, none of this could have happened. So I want to recognize each and every one of them as well. Thank you again very much. It's been a pleasure working in the Ojai area for as long as I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Casas. And um, thank you so much for your serene bravery a beautiful phrase and um just so grateful to you and all of you for taking care of us and and uh keeping us safe so did i say one thing great real quick? story too yeah. i did everybody i talked to that witnessed what was happening there in 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 real time they it was a close call thank you you saved a really important part of our community that's right next to the ohi art center the condos our libby park so your, your quick actions, I think, save some of our heritage very, very, in a very real way. So thank you. You're a hero. Thank you. Um, all right, moving on to the consent calendar. Oh, I'm sorry, public communication. Uh, Gail, do we have any, any on Zoom? Um, the only person I have listed for Zoom is Bill Miley, and I believe he's there in person. So if he would like to speak on Oh, I think he wanted okay. to speak on the consent calendar. So okay. we have no one listed for public communications. Okay, thank you, Gail. All right, well, moving on to the consent calendar, a motion to approve everything? Uh, Mayor Sticks, I have a quick question on item F. Okay. Be very quick if we could pull that. Okay, um, any other items? Okay, okay. Uh, second. A second, all right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Or nay, yep. Excuse me, who was the person who made the motion? Councilman Haney made the motion. Thank you. Haney and Weirich. Thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, F? Very quick question for the city attorney. 
there's a list of issues laid out here in terms of the planning commission to take up on the uh, study assessment guidelines. I want to make sure that we're not exclusive to that list. Like if something occurs to me or other council members, they can, they're free to bring up in an open-ended way issues within I'm, that overall framework. It's not limited to the issues named in other words. Absolutely. The list is the list to, to include for sure, but additional items could be added on top. Okay. Well, with that understanding, I move approval. Okay, all in favor or opposed? Aye. 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 Okay, um, I just got, um, thank you. I just got one public comment, Cindy Jones. Thank you, I got that in a, a bit late. Um, since um, agenda number six is off, um, agenda item number six has been taken off, I just wanna just briefly talk about it. Um, while I think the EFM um, proposal has mostly good practices and, and good goals, I think it's um, far overreaching and it could be much simpler. Um, it, it appears to be a plan that was already um, implemented in the city of um, Malibu and other large cities. And it just looks like whoever did that just took in cut and pasted and tried to make it appropriate for Ojai. And um, I, I have several questions about the proposal and I know that you're gonna bring it forward in the next meeting after all of you guys have had time to, to vet it. Um, but in the meantime, I do have a question. Um, why were the notifications about that being taken off of the the um, agenda only sent to members of the Green Coalition. The, the city didn't send any notifications about it being taken well, off. Well, somebody the did, because they knew. I can I, I can answer in okay. part, if I may. Um, we 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 sent the cancellation to the same people that we sent the announcement to, and we also posted the cancellation on on Facebook and social media. Um, we received information at the at very, at very last minute yesterday morning that changed uh, our perceptive on parts of it. Mm -hmm. And we felt it was better to continue it at a later date. Well, but was there a problem? I, I, I agree, it is better to go back and review some okay. things, but I, I don't do social media, so. I just happened to be a member of the Green Coalition and I got the email. Uh -huh. And so I alerted other people to it because and other tried, people didn't know. We tried know. to send it out to everyone we could think of that had been involved in, in the past. We sent out maybe three or 400 notices, not just also the people that belong to a group known as uh, Transition Ojai, mm -hmm. you know, Pesticide Free mm -hmm. Ojai, we sent it to that. It's still not kind of the general public is what I'm saying. And it and it seems like the general public gets left out of a lot of things that are going on in the city. And kudos to Randy for earlier saying that we need more public participation in the Ojai plan. I heard you earlier on Zoom talking about that. And we do. And we need younger people involved as well. So... Um, and just, just, just to clarify for you, it wasn't technically off the agenda until we just voted on it. Right. So that's why it's kind of confusing, too. Had we known as a council and been able to say it was taken off, I think as a city, we would have provided some notice, but mm -hmm. we couldn't because procedurally it was put on the public agenda, which means it's only taken off if we vote on taking it off. Mm -hmm. So this was an interesting situation where the proponents mm -hmm. of it in the last minute decided they were going to advocate for taking it off. So it wasn't really official, but it was kind okay. of a courtesy notice. So it's a little bit of uh, slipping through the cracks on how things work, uh, making the sausage. Okay. But um, unfortunately, it, yes, we, we should do better. We were very concerned about a number of people showing up and you know, we, we it's always an unlucky situation where we have something like that happen and people want to speak about it, but thank you for showing up anyway. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to make sure that I, I made my uh, point clear that all of the community needs to be involved in these decision-making processes. And it seems like the Green Coalition is like really embedded 
with the city council to me. And it leaves out a large group of people. I happen to be a member of the Green Coalition, but I don't know how many members there are, but certainly not all of OHI. And certainly not all of OHI does um, Facebook. So I just wanted to make that clear. May I respond, Mary Sticks? All of OHI can sign up for these notices. You know, we have an app now, it's so easy. And it's people have to take responsibility mm -hmm. because I, we have I an agree. excellent website. The information is there. We can't lead people by the hand, you know, to do the reading for them. Mm. So we make we do in fairness, we make every effort. Also, I want to make sure the public understands that this policy applies to po city property only. Oh, yes, it's not private yes. property. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I, I still think it's far overreaching. Because Thank you. It only starts here with the city, and then it'll go into our private properties. Thank you, Cindy. Interesting. There, just one, just one comment. Um, uh, it's just bad optics. What took place? It's just bad optics. Oh, it, it sends the wrong message to the public that there's a small group of individuals that are getting more information than the body of the whole, which is the whole community. No matter if the community belongs to Facebook or Twitter or all the other nonsense that's out there. But but it's just bad optics, and we, we, we have to do better. And, and we want to encourage everyone to sign up for the agenda that gets sent out via yeah. email. In fact, I get the agenda faster signing up through the city than I ever do from the city itself when I'm on the council. Um, so I always get it first through our blast email, and then I get it uh, directly from the city. Uh, but on this one, unless I'm mistaken, there would not have been any notice if you had the app or sign up or anything. There was no, there would have been no notice on this. So I don't want to mislead anyone. There's nothing you could have signed up for. Uh, someone just let the Green Coalition know apparently what they believed was going to get voted on in a meeting, which um, I, I don't think is how it probably should have gone. But it was kind of a courtesy so that people would know not to show up and make sure they were here for the next time when it does come up. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, all right, moving on to discussion items. Uh, number two, the adoption of an ordinance to create a two-year pilot program for inclusion of tiny house regulations into the ADU section of the Ojai Municipal Code. Uh, James, maybe the staff report, please. Yes, and uh, this is the um, second reading, so it will. Uh, I'll give a brief staff report that will be very similar to the uh, the one last time, but for those who may have missed that. Um, uh, the Planning Commission had reviewed a uh, and recommended a movable tiny homes ordinance back on August 1st, 2018. Uh, on August 28th, 2018, the City Council reviewed the ordinance as well, but chose not to adopt at that time. Uh, earlier this year, uh, when the City Council discussed goals, one of the main goals, uh, just like today's um, joint meeting with the PC, was uh, potential housing options uh, that could help address the city's need for housing stock. One of the potential programs identified at that time that um, for return for council consideration was the idea of a two-year limited pilot program for movable tiny homes. Uh, the city council voted to direct staff to bring forward that ordinance. Uh, that ordinance was brought forward at the last meeting and is here today for the second reading. And uh, just to um, reiterate, uh, the ordinance would be a two-year pilot program that would allow 10 permits for tiny homes, movable tiny homes per year that would result in 20 total tiny homes at the end of the two-year period. To be eligible, a movable tiny house must be an accessory building, meaning it's accessory to a principal dwelling unit on site, uh, just like an ADU, and it treats a, uh, tiny homes similar to ADUs uh, in multiple ways. Uh, the movable tiny house must be licensed and registered with the DMV, must be built to ANSI standards similar to an RV, must be towable or on a towable frame and designed not to move on its own power, must be an appropriate size to be movable on public highways, must have at least 150 square feet of first floor living space, must include living, sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation areas, must be designed to look like a conventional building, and will be subject to the design review for that purpose. Uh, it's not like a, uh, it won't, won't be able to look like a traditional RV. 
must be sighted be behind the principal dwelling unit before the rear setback line. Uh, must be placed on a permitted permanent foundation with the wheels removed or with jacks to uh, to prevent movement, uh, and uh, must have an all weather surface pedestrian path that will be provided from the street to the main entrance. It's also required to have at least 80 square feet of exterior decking and subject to the same utility requirements as ex same utility requirements as accessory dwelling unit units. Uh, the ordinance also includes a prohibition on excessive movement, meaning uh, the movable tiny homes can only be moved once a year. Uh, so they can only be moved on to a property once once a year. Um, uh, there's a couple questions that we received uh, that, that we wanted to uh, just answer for the uh, council and the public. Um, some of them we answered uh, maybe um, short or quickly last week, but um, one is the, the question we've received multiple times of, are these tiny homes uh, are going to count towards the city's RENA affordable housing numbers? Uh, the answer at this time is that we do not believe so, but it, uh, but it is unclear if that's going to change or if HCD will, will make these count at some point. Um, we also um, were asked uh to uh if these tiny homes are built to the same building standards that the building code is built to uh, i don't know it felt like my microphone cut out but let me see was it working it's all right now okay um the, so to reiterate these tiny homes are not built to our city building code standards we had received questions about if that means that the fire hardening that the building the city adopted in the building code standard standards is applicable it's not because they're not built to the building co code they're built to ANSI standards uh, also the city's reach codes would not be apl applicable because uh, again that would be applied through building code and these would not be subject to the building code uh, we also received some questions about you know how these would be our uh, how these would be insured and how they would be um, how they would um, be taxed, and in short, uh, you know that the the insurance question is a question each homeowner should talk to their uh, insurance provider and uh, determine how it will be treated. Uh, there is no um, standard answer for that at this time, and uh, as for um, taxes. Be, um, we, uh, they, these may be uh, subject to reappraisal or it may make somebody's property subject to reappraisal, reappraisal uh, depending on the circumstances. So that is something that property owners should consider before installing as well. So, um, but with that, I think that was the bulk of the questions. Uh, we were asked by council last meeting to look further into the affordability issue and whether um, the pad or the house or itself can be uh, required to be affordable. And so we have analyzed that. Um, it was a legal analysis. So I'm gonna turn it over to the city attorney for that uh, discussion quickly. Thank you, Mr. Vega. So we took a look at whether the city can require movable tiny homes, the pads of both, to be maintained affordable, to limit the rental right, the rental price. And the answer is no, in short, but I'll, in a little bit fuller, as to the units themselves, that is the person who rents the unit to live in it, they are exempt by state law from rent control because they will be newly built after February 1st, 1995. The, as to the, and that applies both to the rental of the unit itself. So if somebody just, uh, a landowner rents the unit out, um, or if they rent the unit and the pad together, however the, the contract is structured, if it's a rent for the unit, that is exempt by state law from city's rental regulation if it's the pad only, so this is the second category where uh, a movable tiny house is owned by the uh, movable tiny home owner or the resident, and then they drive it onto, a, onto land owned by someone else and pay them rent for the pad, that's a bit of a gray area. Uh, my best assessment is that a reviewing court is likely to conclude that uh, the city could impose that, but it will likely be challenged and it's uncertain because the most analogous area of law is the traditional mobile homes. And for traditional mobile homes, any newly built space that is newly built pad after February 1st, 1990 
is barred by state law from being subject to rent control. Now, these movable tiny homes are not the same as traditional mobile homes. So there's a window, but it's a bit of a narrow window. Uh, and I'll caution the council that if there's interest in further assessing that, we'd be happy to do so and really, really drill down into that. But it, it, uh, there is substantial risk of litigation there. There is an exception. The exception would be if the city, by contract through a development agreement or otherwise, were to grant special permission in return for required affordability. We see this with affordable housing projects that may come through in the future, where you get an extra 10 or 15 units in return for X amount being kept affordable. The same thing could be done with tiny houses, although it would be difficult to do so on a, on a one-off basis. That would make more sense in a tiny home village context, uh, which is something a bit different than what's on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, question? Uh, yeah, question. Um, the, the exemption from state law that you cited that affords to all ADUs, not just tiny houses, is that correct? The, yes, any ADU that is newly built after February 1st, 1995 is exempt from rent control. And period. And I'll note now the city has no rent control right now. Rent control or rent stabilization, the city does not have that. If the city were to adopt it, which is a council choice, not on tonight's agenda, um, that could only apply to buildings built before February 1st, 1995. That's the, the Costa Hawkins Act, which you may recall, there was a proposal on the last general election ballot to undo that that failed. But it's a, it's a topic of discussion in Sacramento. Okay, let me, let me see if I understand that, okay? <laughs> You're... What did you say the date was that rent control applies could apply to if we did go in that direction? February 1st, 1995. A rental unit, a residential rental unit had to have existed before February 1st, 1995 for the city to have any power to regulate its rent. And are you saying that we could never have any power to regulate the rent on ADUs, newly built because, ADUs? Yes, because every ADU is built by definition, after February 1st, 1995, with the possible exception, I will say, any newly built ADU out, an ADU that existed before that was converted, maybe. The challenge, though, is, um, well, actually, the challenge point there is that single family homes are also exempt from rent control, and ADUs are, ADUs are under single family homes. So likely you're exempt, you're out of it two ways. The one point I will add that wasn't discussed in staff report because it wasn't the question, but it's worth noting. There is some state control of uh, residential rental rentals that does even apply to single family homes, depending on how many, how many of the homes the landowner owns. Um, so that may apply, but uh, the city would not have power to do it if the ADU or the tiny home is built after February 1st, 1995. Okay, and that's state law. We don't have the power to fix that unless, unless Sacramento does. Unless the state fixes it. Yeah. Okay, let me process that. Yeah, Randy? I have a, I have a couple questions. Um, the first one is the... Uh, uh, We gave them a uh, um, it's I'm missing the word here, but it'll come to me in a second. We gave them the status of an ADU, which then exempted them with that status from the high fire zone construction practices. Am I correct, Matt or Jane? It's it's not it wasn't the ADU status that exempted them. It's the um, subjecting them to ANSI standards, um, so which, which is essentially saying that they can be built like an RV. And I'll add just one complexity to that. The current proposal is ANSI or NFPA, um, similar standards. But yeah, by, by allowing them to be built to standards equivalent to um, modern RVs, that exempted them from the building code. Then, then if we did that, then why did we give them um, an ADU, an ADU uh, standing? I, I think that's where I, where I'm conflicted. Is um, we created a a gray area for them to be exempt from 
construction standard construction practices in the in the community. Um, yet that's on one side of the construction part of it, and then we give them all of the other components of an ADU, which is are exempt from, you know, sewer connection fees and, um, you know, solar and uh, uh, maybe Title 24 electrical. Um, th that's where I get a little lost here. Is we create we created we created a box. We put these in it. We gave them all types of status and all types of of breaks. Um, and, and then what are we getting in return for that? That's, so that's, that's one of my concerns, just right up front. I'm letting the council know that's one of my biggest concerns is how we came about this entitlement, which in turn um, prevents us from doing some of the things that we wanna do with, with um, constructing in a high fire zone, which we all are in agreement with. That's, pretty, that's a pretty big concern right now. Um, the second thing is, um, I guess you touched on it with the taxes. So if a family of four moved into a tiny home and two of their children were going to school, could be three people, could be one child, doesn't matter. Um, are they going to be assessed the, um, the school tax that, that, that goes along with that assessment on your, on your house? Am I correct? No, so it, it would be treated like an ADU. So the property owner, the owner of the parcel would pay their property tax. Adding the tiny home may potentially increase that property tax, but the person living in that tiny home would not be paying, you know, school bond or things like that. So, so then the person who technically the person- Hold on a second. Before, I, I need to stop you right there. The, the current- bonding schedule in the community facilities district that the district that took over Golden State Water includes that if you have two dwellings on the same property, you pay two taxes. So okay. that may be true for school, but we, I don't, I, I cannot, I mean, like if you put, if you put an ADU on your property, you get double the mellow roost tax on the, the water bond. Yeah. So the correct answer, I, I guess not to generalize, they're treated like ADU. So if the ADU is subject to the tax, the movable tiny homes. So yeah, you may get another water bond. There may not be another school bond. Or right. Well, the, well, that's a different issue. Yeah, we're, I just want to make sure. Yeah, but I'm glad you brought that up because that would be the same thing. So again, the individual that's um, allow, that's allowing this structure to be built on their uh, property needs to be aware of these. So do we have, a, uh, have we prepared? Are we going to prepare? any form of a punch list that we hand out in the permitting or in the planning phase that acknowledges all of the um, issues that might be related to putting one of these. Um, someone used the term the other day, a, a, a portable matchbox, but, um, but it just, you know, are we going to do something like that? So yeah, the public I, is aware. I really, and I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I know, uh, I know we're thinking on the same wavelength. That's why is that I'm very concerned that there's a lot of hidden fees and costs in this, and we're going to make it sound like this great proposal. We know the public has has indicated that they they have some interest in doing this, and I'm very concerned though that somebody's going to roll one of these in their backyard, put a pad up, and not realize all the extra expenses they're going to have, because it's not clear whether they're exempt from sanitation or not. It's not clear whether they're exempt from these bonds, the taxes, the tax implications, not being able to move it for a year, do anything else, um, and the fact that they're not cheap. The building requirements are a little strange compared to regular other dwellings and ultimately it's you know they're they're not inexpensive and the numbers as they pan out are not overly affordable so um it's just important that we make sure if people want to do this that we don't end up with people who are trapped losing money by trying to help and that, that's what i'm worried about people with good intentions trying to put a, a, a tiny home in their backyard and, and, and go through all this process and find out the hard way that it's much more expensive, which I do know uh, specifically some people who went through that with ADUs and you know, went from 200 to 300 to 400,000. They ended up with a you know, 900 square foot ADU. It's 400 grand. So At this point of order, are we deliberating before no, we take public comment? We're comments? still asking questions. So Any other answer, questions for oh, staff? Oh, uh, there was a, a, a simple question in there, I think, which is, have we prepared materials, you know, um, giving that information? The answer is no. Would we? Yes. If if this is adopted, we would prepare a, a punch list and materials for the public. So. Any other questions? Oh, I just want to apologize because 
all the questions I asked were in the staff report, but of course they're, it's of interest to the public too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Gail, any public comments on Zoom on this item? The only person I have signed up for a public comment is again Bill Miley, but I believe he's there in person. In person, okay. All right, we have four public comments. Leslie Hess, Bill Miley, Larry, Larry, you, you need fine gold, okay. It's tough, your handwriting. <laughs> and, and then Dale Hansen. Hello, um, my name is, for the record, Bill Miley. Oh, as you know, I favor modular houses and manufactured homes for accessory dwelling units. But in this case, if you all are going to adopt a two-year pilot ordinance for tiny houses, I have some comments and some positive suggestions. So let's assume it's adopted. Competition one, competition for tiny house pads to place your tiny house on is going to be really high. In my limited research on Craigslist, I found one in California at $750 a month. Two. Regarding costs, what about using a pad at Lake Casitas? Uh, Casitas Recreation charges $40, $40 per night for a full hookup. And you only can stay there 14 days each month. Their Snowbird program allows up to six months if available, and they charge 40 nights, $40 per night, which is $1,200 a month. Three, new pads in Ojai with full hookups look like they would be very attractive to folks living elsewhere wanting to spend time in oh price per night is unknown we don't know what it will be but likely the market rate for having a full hookup pad and buying and placing a tiny house on it and making it affordable does not seem possible unless the owner offers subsidized rent um number five to make a tiny house rentable for a family, probably no more than two people, the property owner is going to have to offer a subsidy or agree to rent it at a low rent, not market rate. Six and last. Since the primary goal of adding more house units here in Ojai is to create workforce housing and affordable workforce housing, a cooperative program with city government is suggested. I've mentioned this before. The city helps the property owner buy the tiny house in exchange for an agreed affordable rent over a number of years, like 10 or more, after which the owner would buy the city out over a period of years. So in summary, full pads for rent will probably get us new residents, maybe somebody wanted, some of them wanting to work here. And I see tiny houses or pads would provide family residents, additional guest stays, and would likely only help our workforce if subsidized for affordability. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Next, we have Leslie Hess, and then Larry, and then Dale. I still think the ti tiny house pads should be investigated further by the staff, and that possibly the pads could be con rent controlled. And if you could please direct staff to explore all options to make tiny home pads available to very low and extremely low income households and include that in the tiny pad ordinance. The tiny pads would help people with the highest need. And if you wanna give them help this is a good way to start. It's small, but I think it's important. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Larry? Thank you. Uh, it's Steingold, not Feingold, close enough. I got now, Steingold. Uh, thank you. Um, I think ADUs are interesting. I mean, it's a cross between a mobile home, an RV, and a house. I think they're good for possibly affordable housing, as long as they go toward the REFI, is that what you said, the, the housing that we have to comply to? If it goes toward that, then fine. If it doesn't, then it's not gonna be affordable. But my concern is parking. A family of four, two cars, three cars, who knows? 
where are they going to park? Are they going to be we're going to require off street parking? Because if you have ADUs on drown, there's not going to be any space on drown. Um, the fire marshal, I don't know what not coming from here and um, don't know the rules and regulations regarding fire uh, access. But does the fire marshal approve where the ADA ADU goes so that they can have access by the fire apparatus and personnel? Because lots of homes here have gates and walls and what have you. Um, the metric that you're going to use for either extending the program or killing it two years from now, you should be started one and a half years from now. And the metric should be very specific. I mean, what, what, are the, what are the metrics? Like they're definable, it's easy, it's simple, it's transparent, it's no big deal. Airbnbs, I understand, are not involved in the city, correct? Not permitted? Then if that there should be a law that says nobody can use this ADU as an Airbnb or they have to remove the pad and remove the ADU, you lose it. There's no nonsense, there's nothing. Either you have a law that says no Airbnb and that's fine, but you got to pull the a, the uh, the mobile home goes. Sorry, the uh, ADU. Um, but that's the big thing. But it's a nice place if you can figure out that's where you're going to put grandma, or you're going to put your son or somebody from college, or they're coming home. And it may be great for workforce, but it really isn't a home. It's more like a a shed with a toilet. I mean, we're either going to do it or do it right. I mean, permit permit more housing, but not in a commercial zone because you don't have much commercial here. And if you turn this town into all housing, you wanna see prices go up through the roof, you ain't seen nothing yet. So that's, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Dale Hansen. Thank you, I'm Dale Hansen. I live in the city of Ojai. I think my question or comment might have been handled already with uh, with what Randy Haney said. But I thought when the city manager was speaking about the um, uh, the tiny homes, that there was a comment made that, and maybe I'm mistaken, that they wouldn't ha uh, uh, be the same fire codes that are elsewhere. And since we may even have more fire hardening issues coming, I was just wondering, are they gonna meet those fire hardening codes? Thank you, Dale. You want to answer? Yeah. I could quickly answer that. Um, just so these are uh, the ANSI standards apply to these, or uh, I think it's NFPA, uh, or it was the other one that we drafted it to, but the building code does not. So any fire hardening in the building code would not apply to these. Thank you, James. Um, normally I would speak last. I'm going to use the mayor's authority tonight to speak first because I really want to make sure that we approach this in the right way and for the right reasons and that these homes benefit people who really need them. Um, limiting rents on tiny home pads is a great start in providing places to live for very low and extremely low income households. These are the folks who need the help the most. This is the point of the ordinance, isn't it? To provide homes to those who need them most Mobile home pads and trailer pad rentals have been regulated for decades in other jurisdictions throughout the state. Though a maximum of 20 tiny home pads can be approved over a period of two years, the council has an opportunity to make 20 homes for very low and extremely low income people. Unlike stationary ADUs in Ojai, where rents are unregulated, tiny homes are not mandated by the state and we have discretion. Come on, council, let's use our discretion to help those in need rather than feeding the Ojai gentrification machine that continues to push those of modest means out of our town. My support of tiny homes in Ojai is contingent on whether or not this council has the will to make this option within reach to very low and extremely low income people and to examine all options to do so before approving the ordinance, not after the fact. And I have a motion I definitely want to hear from the rest of council, so thank you. Mayor, could, um, could I ask um, our city attorney and city manager to respond to find out if this is possible? 
Yes, it's possible. It's a matter of um, uh, policy choice, where the council wants to put the policy choice. The council could choose to introduce the ordinance as proposed with modifications, and then second, separately decide to pursue affordability requirements for the pad rentals. Option one, option two, as proposed by the mayor, would be to tie the two together and move the ordinance forward contingent only upon uh, making an affordable pad rental requirement, which would mean in tonight the direction will be staff to go back and us to draft something for review by full council because obviously we, we don't have a rental regulation component drafted tonight. Option three would be to take no action at this time. Uh, it's possible. It, there's risk in, inherent in that choice. Uh, the risk is that the property rights advocates may seek to strike down the affordability requirement. Um, as I noted in the staff report, the law is uncertain here. I can't guarantee the outcome. And I'm not revealing anything that anyone doesn't already know in this public statement, the law is uncertain on this. We'd be the first city in the state to try a affordable re affordability requirement for uh, tiny house pads, but that doesn't mean we won't succeed. It just means I can't guarantee we succeed. And there will be some additional cost and risk if somebody does file suit. The other thing that's worth bearing in mind as a practical challenge is that if the council requires affordability up front, tiny house owners and property owners will have to make the choice with full knowledge whether they do or do not want to install a pad. You can't. The city lacks the power to compel anyone to install a pad or to build a tiny house. So if the requirement is that the pad rentals, that any pad built that's not on which the, the landowner does not install a tiny house themselves can only be rented at an affordable rate, assuming we can get past the litigation risk and we can enforce that requirement, uh, whether that will result, how many uh, pads that will be then made available as affordable rental pads is a very open question because that'll be an individual property owner's choice. Again, not to say not to do it. It's not my choice. It's policy choice, but that's something to consider. Ryan. Thank you. Um, as the bell tower goes off, that's the second time tonight. I'm landing on both. Three, I got lucky. Minutes ahead. I had a bird fly in my house today. I knew there was going to, I knew there was an omen. Um, if we're talking about extremely low income individuals and the people that need it the most, right? Um, the problem is we could force people, let's say hypothetically in a perfect world that we could make the pad free. We could say you have to put a pad in and you're not allowed to charge any rent for the pad. But then the person has to bring their own tiny home. And if we're talking about individuals that are the most in need of housing, how are they ever going to do that? You can't finance these. They're expensive. They're not cheap. If they had the money to buy their own tiny home, I don't know if they qualify or would be in that most in need situation. The only way I can really, what it sounded a little bit like was that as if the city would be building 10 pads and then renting them out on some affordable level and letting people park there or something. I don't know, but I don't know how it makes logical sense that even if we had all the control in the world to keep the price of the pad in the backyard or the group of pads in the tiny home village low, how you can't control if, if the rent, if the landlord is the one who brings in the tiny home, they can set whatever rent they want. We can't control it at all. That's what I'm hearing, Mr. Summers, correct? Nope. There's no control we have over the actual rent of the home, just the rent of the pad. Correct. And so, yeah, we don't really we know under any of these circumstances, the only way to have any old, full control over keeping it affordable is if the party that's living in it brings their own tiny home. But then we're asking them to to be able to afford their own tiny home, which has financing issues, which has, you know, it's a, it, it doesn't the cost doesn't the, the value doesn't go up like a normal home. It's probably going to go down more like an RV. I mean, these are very bad economic situations to force someone into if we're trying to get them out of a, you know, out of super low income or a very low income or whatever <clears throat> the heck it is. So I just, it seems like that, that sounds great, but I don't know how we could ever actually make it happen. May I comment? I, I think I was next. Okay. Oh, I was oh, oh, sorry. Okay. I was Bill, after. Randy, and then Susan. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of things, uh, Mayor Six, that I, I'm, I'm a little confused about and trying to understand. Uh, to Ryan's point, unless we are uh, subsidizing construction, there has to be a rate of return uh, to, you know, on the cost of putting the pad in. All right. And I think um, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure where the, uh, uh, the, all the affordability standards are based on 
housing as a whole right now in terms of a percentage of income. And so I don't know how you, uh, I don't know how you break out the, uh, the cost of the pad itself in terms of that. I, I have long been of the opinion uh, that it's maybe better to think about um, an approach to rent state uh, using rent stabilization rather than rent control as an approach where uh, you limit the amount of, of uh, rent increases per year. I think that's that doesn't have the the uh, the, the risk of redu of eliminating the uh, the rate of return, which means you get no capital invested in the purpose that you are hoping for. So I'm I'm not sure how this implements you know in uh, in real time. The other point I think I am I hearing that we're talking about rental. So if a property owner wanted to put in a, a pad for a member of their family or for them to move into, it wouldn't apply to them. Is, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and apply to, answer, to an owner occupied right. or a, a member of household occupied sure, situation. Yeah, right. But um, wouldn't apply to that at all. Yeah, ideally, you're not charging your kids an right. exorbitant amount of rent. Um, so, um, so I guess I, I guess I'm trying to understand where the metric would come from. Well, that's, that's why all the available metrics right. are for uh, housing overall. And my my request is that we direct staff to look to answer those questions, okay. because, of course, you know, tiny homes are a very new Right. You know, for all of us. I, so. I would be more interested in saying if you've got if you put a pad in and you have a rent on it, you know, you're not going to uh, uh, to do a loss leader thing where you get somebody on there and you uh, jack them up 20, 30 percent a year or something. I'm more interested in rent stabilization rather than rent control is something more practical mm -hmm. personally. Um, but anyway, I just I and my last comment is, please, this is a pilot program that we're learning from. I made the comment at the last meeting. Let's not, you know, in the in uh, reaching for perfect, defeat the good. I, I just, I think this is opening up choice for ADUs, and we ought to take it in that but spirit. What would what would stop somebody from making the pad a dollar a year, and then they can charge whatever they want for the rent because we can't control it? I don't understand why. I mean, well, yeah, you're renting if you're renting the pad. And yeah, to be clear, right, renting the pad, the pad <laughs> if if the the contract includes the unit and the person has lives into it, whether they're uh, then that is all one. We can't regulate it. Yes, it's we all can't one. split the unit in the pad. They're not going to get two bills. Yeah, you rent it to them as a package. Yeah. So there's two states of the world. The person rents the unit, and the and thus that that rental right includes the right to have the lease of the land, and that we can't regulate um, if it's built as all of these will be after February first, nineteen ninety five. Right. And to Councilmember Wyrick, that includes both rent control right. and rent stabilization. If you're just renting the pad. And but if you're renting, there, just rent the pad, you got to bring your own tiny home. Correct. There are people do, that are ready to do that. I, I agree, but I don't I don't believe and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the data is I don't have great data. Maybe I'm missing something here. But those aren't the people we're trying to target. Yeah, for this. this is not those this. aren't the extremely low income people. I, I, I understand they can spend that. a hundred grand on a right. tiny home. I mean, yeah. if they get well, one for free, maybe it's something. But for, that's what I'm trying to say is we're trying to expand the number of check marks we get here at the risk of losing the entire program to try it. Randy? So this is, uh, again. Um, Opening is up it, choice for ADUs. Yeah, right? well, it, well, it's an alternate that way, but it's also, like, again, these are all the concerns that the community has also is, um, I don't think there's any way that we could guarantee any pricing on any of this because there's so many variables. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is, I haven't seen a ton of community members community members, people that live here, um, come to council and ask for these. Now, I've seen a number of people that live outside of the city, um, even from, you know, further up Northern California, even out of state, that would love to live in Ojai and would love to have the opportunity of bringing their tiny home into Ojai. So I, I understand that side of it, too. I'm just... Uh, um, you know, part of me wants to go along with this. And then the other part of me says, you know, there's some quality of life issues. There's some um, real, real um, concerns about affordability. And are they? And, and is this the, the route to go? So, you know, I've asked that. I go back and forth on this. Um, I guess another <clears throat> question I wanted to ask staff, if, if, and we can keep the discussion going, is, can we limit the number of tiny homes on a street? Because one of the quality of life issues that have been brought to my attention is what if I 
if, if I had a tiny home on each side of me, um, that may not affect the person who is actually who wants a tiny home on that site. But it, but if I don't want it, it sure impacts me. So um, how do we address that so that we limit to a degree the locations of these um, if if this trial effort goes through? But I think that that's a component that we need to address. Do you want to answer that? Short answer, yes. The city could impose a concentration or low amount limits, yes. But is what it, it's, if it's the same as an accessory dwelling unit, first of all, I don't think that's going to be a problem. But secondly, could, can the city then uh, um, have that same standard for any accessory dwelling unit? Unfortunately, no, because regular ADUs, that is, that are built, stick built as part of the house or next to the house, uh -huh. are protected by state law from any kind of concentration okay. limit. Okay, thank it's you. It's only because tiny houses are <clears throat> something well beyond okay. what state law. But now I want to say what I was going to say. I, uh, I, I could be wrong, but my what I've seen uh, from people living in actual tiny houses, um, most of them will probably be built by the by the owner of the property because you have to put a deck around it. You have to make it really nice. It has to look like a house. I think there's going to be very few people bringing in um, uh, a tiny, you know, tiny houses come in a wide price range from as little as 20,000 to, as, and the prices are, are changing because the, te the, the way they're being built is changing. <clears throat> um, but I can't imagine that put, uh, not passing this because of concern about the pad cost uh, will have that much impact one way or the other. I think what uh, Council Member Weirich said about the rent stabilization is far more important. And that would apply to all ADUs. You know, we need rent stabilization for, for yeah, well, uh, to as much as we can legally do it. I, I'm really uh, puzzled about trying to imagine, you know, the, 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 it's gonna, there's gonna be very few instances, I think, when, the, when someone is bringing in a tiny home, you know, and, and, if, and if they bring in one that actually looks like a house and, and the owner builds a deck, I don't think the cost of the pad is gonna be an issue. And I just don't, I don't see it. So, Mayor? Not yet, anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I was just, I, so I, I, th I think we all agree. I, I think in that case, though, that tiny home, we can't control how much they rent it out for. Well, the tiny home itself is going to belong to the person. There's, right, the two, we, there's two distinct scenarios, as others have pointed out. There's the, the probably the most common scenario is where the owner of the property puts up the tiny home most likely for a family member or for themselves so they can rent out the larger house that kind of, or a friend. It's gonna be likely someone that they already know, not a, not a stranger. And um, then there's a scenario that I think Mayor Betsy has in mind where somebody brings in the tiny home from the outside and doesn't wanna be charged an arm and a leg for the pad. Is that correct? And more specific, yes. And also that staff looks at ways where we could actually make this for very low and extremely low income households. You know, so that's what I would like to see. And, and you know, we don't know the answer right now. It's a question. We can assess it further if that's the council's direction. Uh, Randy? So again, this goes back to what I said earlier about this ADU status. So Matt, maybe you need to answer this question. If we've given these this ADU status, and and um, you're saying that uh, we can't put any type of rent control on an ADU, is that what I heard? But yes. now you're saying we can put a rent control on a tiny home. Because so are they an ADU or are they a tiny home? And I, that's the argument that we've been arguing about for years now. What is it? And how do we now exempt some? Again, this is that gray box we've created. Well, this side of it, you get all of these things, and over here, eh, we don't care about those things. But we so they don't fit into a single category all the way up to, up and down the train. The current proposal is that they're treated as ADUs, but by uh, 
which means that by state law, we can't tr we can't regulate the rental or stabilize the rent of the unit because they're all built after 95. But the pad is different because the pad and that's where they're they're just not like to use because the land and the the land of the unit can be separated. So so we have the right to declare anything in ADU. Is that what I'm hearing? No. Any new construction? No. Any, because goes, anything that we determine as an ADU standard, we can throw it at it. Because what if someone sues us over the fact that, well, you declared this as an ADU, yet you've created all these exemptions. Uh, for instance, this wood deck that we're requiring to put around these ADUs that aren't built to our fire standards um, because they're exempt. So that's a choice the council can make. That's not, that's not, this is, there's just so much gray in this. There's, there's so many unanswered questions. And the, the reality is what it is, is it's an opportunity. If you want to put in a less expensive ADU that is similar to an ADU, but it's not the same. It's mobile. We have to follow the requirements. It can be a lot less expensive than an ADU, but we still can't rent control it. We can maybe rent control the pad, but if they don't bring their own one in, which is highly unlikely that they're going to do and be in the class that we're trying to put this housing available for, that we can't control what they're going to rent it out for. Now, if you want to put your son in the backyard and do it, you don't have to charge any rent. You don't have to charge any rent at all if you don't want to. We can't control that you have to charge rent. We can't control that you don't charge any rent. But the pad itself is not going to get us any type of rent stabilization or rent control on a consistent basis for the very low income individuals unless they somehow got a free or a, they were able to procure a tiny home and then they're looking for a pad to put it on that's less expensive. And that that's the, the legal framework that's so difficult for what we're trying to do. I'm not against this as a pilot project. I'm not against the idea, but trying to formulate a way that we think we can control what these are going to cost and trying to make sure they're designed for very low income individuals. I don't think we have the ability to do that. That doesn't mean that the market won't dictate that. That doesn't mean the owner can't rent them out for very low income people. Yeah. That's a, but that's a personal choice, not a government choice. Right. And, and there are people, I believe, that want to make that personal choice. They have friends that they don't feel they want to rent a room to because people like their privacy, but they would be more inclined to do something like that if they can afford to do it. And also, let's remember that the more choices we pe that people have, the more options that are for rent, that in itself helps to lower the price, can help to lower the price of the rent. And as far as fire hazards, let me tell you something. There are older homes. I'm living next to an extreme fire hazard that the city would not let me take down. It's a garage that's going to go up any day now. Okay. And that's, and I see that there's stuff like that old housing all over town. That's a, that's a fire trap. So, you know, that's something else that we need to address. The fi that I don't, I do not see tiny houses that are built to up to standard as any kind of a fire hazard. You know, they can be built out of the right kind of materials and we can, we can, we can have that criteria, you know. Bill? Yeah. I'd like to uh, <laughs> just get back to one point that I think was very valid raised by uh, council person Haney and that's the density issue. And uh, my understanding is uh, in terms of some guidance on how that might work, because I think it is a valid point, you don't want them clustered. Um, isn't our current notification requirement, uh, uh, if you're doing any kind of discretionary work in residential areas, something like 300 feet or is it 500 feet? 500 feet? So I, I'm wondering, we you know we're a pretty small town. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm wondering if it would be possible uh, to include let's say a, uh, where there'd be practical to include, let's say a, a, a 500 radius, 500 foot radius requirement that you can't have uh, more than one in any uh, given 500 foot radius, would that work? Well, I think Mayor Stick's proposal was talking about doing a village. So you would eliminate the idea of a village altogether. Well, a village isn't allowed because it's an ADU. This is all under an ADU yeah. framework and that's, that is self-limiting in terms of. I don't know if the density requirements of an ADU would be it's applied one to this parse? particular one. It's, it's one, one. Well, it's one. Per well, I don't know. I mean, that, I don't, that we may the, have an option to be able to modify that. But. I understand that, but I was thinking no. Mm -hmm. That we do. It, the whole idea is to bring this as a choice, 
with which to express a, uh, our current ADU uh, ordinance. And I think the, but I understand uh, Councilman Haney's concern that we, we could impose a uh, a radius uh, uh, limit so that they're not, you know, all in a row on one street, for example. Uh, that's all I'm proposing. Mm -hmm. I, I understand. The, uh, the limitation of 10 per year, I would think, would take care of that. But then, well, then they I, could have I, five on one street, yeah. technically. I, I agree. Uh, so I'm just wondering whether that would be a practical way of addressing that concern of a 500 foot radius. I'm just asking whether that would be something mm -hmm. that could be handled. It could be done. Yeah, that'd be within the council's power to impose. Mm -hmm. It obviously creates a first mover advantage, uh, and that's okay. Yeah, okay. that's I mean, possible. I, I just, well, right, one quick thing, just to point out. I, uh, if, if we do want to include that in a motion, if I'm not wrong, Mr. Summers, I think 500 feet is for conditional use permits that have to do with alcohol and 300 feet for other conditional use permits is the notice distance. But if I'm wrong, correct me. I thought it was 300 feet. And then the exception was unless it's 500 and a thousand or I'm wrong, but I thought it was three and that, five. That's what I was trying to get to. Well, I just want to make sure it's consistent with the normal system with notice we have distance. Now, and if either, I'm wrong, I was thinking three or 500 as a way of expressing or addressing this concern, which mm -hmm. I think is a valid one. I, I would agree. You don't want to inadvertently uh, all of a sudden have uh, five of them all pop yeah. up, you know, right next to each other in the same street. That would not be in the spirit of what we're proposing, I don't think. Um, Randy? So, so I, I um, you know, I, again, I brought that up because it was a concern that was brought to my attention. The, um, the downside to 500 feet is I have a sense that um, these future ADUs will more than likely go into a larger parcel size. So, um, you know, I was just doing the math. My lot's 80 by 80. So that means every fifth home could have one of these tiny homes um, on my street. So I'm just trying to come up with something. I, I know, makes sense. I, I know I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm saying that's a, it's a good idea. So I, I've, I'm thinking right now that we have presented to staff probably five more legitimate questions that need to come back to council. And maybe at this point, um, we might want to make that recommendation that we table this discussion, that we send these questions back to staff, let them come back at the next council meeting with answers to these, and that we revisit this or continue this. Well, I, thank you, Randy. I do have a motion that would pertain to that. Um, so uh, I move to reconsider this item at a future regularly scheduled city council meeting and direct staff to thoroughly explore all options to make all tiny home pads available to low and very low income households, as this group is the most underserved in our community. And, and less owner occupied? Pardon me? Does that include owner occupied? Uh, I, well, I'd like the staff to look into that, but that doesn't seem to make any sense. Just, you know, if your kid, if your family lives there, it's different. Well, we, and Mayor, just to, just to add to, to amend yours, we also had. Uh, the number of tiny homes per street, um, the density in the fire code. Issue. Yeah, the, dens the, the density mm -hmm. in the fire code. Mm -hmm. So assuming that's okay. yeah, I, I think those are legitimate concerns, and I and I think they deserve well, more time to be looked at and to be brought back. My thinking was that the, this is what the pilot program was about. So I don't know that we can resolve every possible s scenario, but if the council majority wants to bring it back. So be it. I, I'm ready to solve whatever we can solve tonight and, and move forward. Because some of the issues that were brought up, I think uh, the city manager and city attorney could provide answers for. Am I wrong? Uh, where are you with this, Bill? Uh, where am I? Yeah. I want to do a, I would, if my preference is a simple amendment, get a pilot program and try it out. But, you know, that's my position. That, that I, I would be in support of but, that. You know, that doesn't seem to be where the majority is. So yeah. we'll see what motion gets on. I think the mayor has made a motion. And then I'm going to second the motion with my amendments, if you agree. Uh, with yeah. Okay. Uh, roll. I'm uncomfortable with it, but I'll, you know, I'll vote accordingly. Yeah. Okay. Do we need specific? What's the amendment? The distance requirement? Was the fire? I think it's fire hardening standards and the density concentration limits. Mm -hmm. Sure. And options and affordability therefore. options and then the underlying affordability options i think uh, we were just talking i think to dig into those we 
would estimate it would probably be at not at this next meeting but the following meeting okay um all right roll call please gail council member blatz yes council member haney yes mayor sticks yes mayor pro tem wyrick no council member francina there's no easy answer is there <laughs> Um, I'll go ahead because I, but with the understanding that it's brought back in two meetings and hopefully we can move forward at that point. All right, I'll, I'll go ahead and a reluctant yes, very reluctant. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Moving on to number three, the status update of the Ventura River water adjudication. <sighs> Not sure where I have to go tonight, but I know I can't be here. So I'm <laughs> accusing myself as an attorney representing parties in the case. You could go to the green room. Yeah, the green room is really fun. <laughs> <laughs> so this item is on the agenda as just a, a status update. I think um, uh, the Ventura River watershed adjudication was a, a major issue in the valley. And then when COVID hit, uh, the Litigation has definitely slowed, and I think it's we've kind of, you know, uh, it hasn't been on the top of people's minds. So we wanted to take an opportunity to kind of provide a status update and let the community know um, uh, where this is at. Uh, the staff report gives a, a timeline and kind of a history of how uh, the litigation started uh, in a nutshell. Um, in response to a lawsuit from the channel keepers, the city of Ventura uh, named hundreds of property owners within the valley, including the city, uh, in a third amended cross complaint. Uh, and so people may recall right as right before COVID in, in uh, late January, early February, there were public meetings and workshops held to explain, uh, held by the city of Ventura to explain the litigation. Uh, since that time, the city has continued to uh, actively be involved in uh, in the the process, uh, advocating for the Ojai Valley and um, and having uh, uh, attorneys represent uh, the city of Ojai at these hearings. Uh, on um, some of the recent uh, kind of uh, uh, accomplishments, is on September eighth, twenty twenty. Uh, at the request of the city of Ojai, the city of Ventura agreed not to seek attorney's fees or costs against individuals or businesses that were named or noticed in the case. Uh, the city more recently also advocated for and obtained uh, a phase one hearing, which will take place on February 14th, 2022. And that hearing will determine whether Ventura has the legal authority to adjudicate ground, the, the groundwater rights of the four separate groundwater basins in, in this single lawsuit. Uh, so uh, that's another um, uh, item that was, uh, that was uh, scheduled because of the um, advocacy of the city of Ojai. Uh, and then um, since that was scheduled February 14th, the city's also been actively participating in ongoing status conferences. Uh, and recently successfully demanded that the city of Ventura be required to disclose their expert witness and their reports um, so that uh, others would be able to uh, review those and determine whether to hire their own experts to prepare for that phase one hearing. Uh, the court determined that the city of Ventura must serve their expert disclosures by August 31st, next Tuesday. Other key parties, including the city of Ojai, must serve their expert disclosures by September 24th. So that those two items will be the next steps in the process. Um, and so uh, we just, you know, it, we wanted to give kind of an overview of where this is at, what the next couple steps are. Uh, those expert disclosures are working towards the February 14th, 2022 phase one hearing. Uh, and and um, uh, did you have anything to add? I'll let the city attorney add a couple comments. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Vega. Uh, a couple additional points. The Some of the parties in the case have developed a proposed physical solution settlement, uh, notably City of Ventura, the Ventura River Water District, the Miners Oaks Water District, Taylor Ranch, Rancho Matillaha Mutual Water Company, uh, and a couple of others. And uh, that 
proposed physical solution is available on the Ventura River adjud Watershed Adjudication website. Uh, and the link for that is in the staff report available on the city's website. And um, the proposed physical solution is intended to create a plan and funding mechanism to manage the watershed and pay for physical improvements that are designed to improve the fishery situation and the watershed uh, ecology in the Ventura River and the related groundwater basins and to manage water usage through a separate new uh, court created, court overseen, court managed uh, water master that would have representation for Casitas, for the water districts and for the agricultural interests, but not the city of Ojai. To date, the Casitas Municipal Water District, the city's water provider for most of the city of Ojai has not indicated support for that settlement, uh, citing publicly concerns regarding cost allocation and governance structure. The city of Ojai has taken no formal position, but uh, the council has previously stated that it shares some of those concerns. Uh, discussions there are ongoing. Um, residents who are interested in this in the issue further uh, should take a look at the pleadings that are available on the Ventura River Watershed Adjudication.com website uh, and should consider encouraging um, if they live in Casitas, uh, Casitas to take a role in litigation along with encouraging if they have uh, voters in Ventura or friends in Ventura, Ventura to take advantage of its options to limit the impact of the litigation that it has not taken advantage of so far. Further comments I'll ask for staff and council. Questions for staff? No. Do we have any public? Um, yeah, any public comment on this, Gail? No public comments, none, none on Zoom. This is file and receipt. I, I have a comment I'd like to make on it, if that's, if that's all right, Mayor. I, I think one of the problems that the physical solution as promulgated uh, uh, initially is there subtle aspects of a connectivity um, assumptions, both directly and indirectly through the cost allocation, which may not really exist given uh, the actual hydrology relationship between our primary water supply, which is underneath us in the Ojai Aquifer and the stream flow in the, uh, in the Ventura River, which is the basis of the uh, claims by the city of Ventura. So one of the subtle issues here is that uh, uh, simply accepting the physical solution is accepting a uh, some, an aspect of connectivity, which I think actually scientifically or hydrologically does not exist. And I, I think that that's one of the ways that we have to really uh, think through this. And, and I also wanna just, again, for the record, state my opinion that given that our primary water supply is the Ojai Aquifer, that uh, the city definitely has a uh, vital interest in having uh, the accurate uh, hydrological assessment and cost, and cost allocation reflecting that embedded in whatever happens out of this adjudication um, and then state again that the reason we're here for adjudication is because the city of Ventura did not want to accept water it was getting through the Casitas Municipal Water District, wanted more. And that's why we're at, that's why we're at where we're at. And I'll just add, if I may, that the connectivity question is one of the issues and really the primary issue in this phase one trial currently set for February 14th, 2022. And I, I think we did a, a, the community a real service and raising that point of view uh, with the court and it had some traction. Mayor, just briefly, it's, it, to me, this is this whole fight is about survival. And it seems like one city is, um, is taking um, the survival of their entire community uh, for granted. So um, this is the city of Ventura putting their interests ahead of the community. And that's, that's the, the sad part of it. And that's the political side of it. The adjudication and, and the, uh, the hydrology and, and uh, how water flows from uphill, downhill. Um, I mean, to everyone here and uh, all of us in the community, we all understand that. Um, this is just plain and simple, um, a community, the city of Ventura that wants more than their share so that they can continue to grow and they can continue to maintain the infrastructure that they have in place. And probably more importantly, 
is the um, someone brought this up the other day that again every day you learn something new but you know um, they have um, millions and millions of dollars um, due in their um, employment benefit funds that they can't afford right now so they're they're looking at any way they can possibly save and if that means taking our water so that they can do more development so that they can do more growth and more of whatever they want to do those are the that's one of the bottom that's one of the unknown things that we don't talk about and that's the unfunded obligations that that community has and they're huge um that's why they need more that's why they need to continue to build they need more and um and that's what this fight is about it, 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 it's sick that uh, they've spent $70 million to date. Just think if they would have turned that $70 million into infrastructure and into their um, water um, their water um, recycling program. I, I, I mean, it's just, it, it, this is such a wasted lawsuit and, it, and it's, um, and the public knows that. Um, and maybe the public needs and we need to do a better job of communicating that to the city of Ventura. Um, and I think that's one of the, that's one of the roles that we play. Thank you, Randy. Any anyone else? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll move on to number four, the draft of the Ojai Wildfire Resiliency Plan. So uh, yeah, come on back. Right? Um, <laughs> and, uh, so this is coming back at, from the last meeting and um, some council members had questions. So Bob Roper answered them in the staff report. And um, do you have anything to add, James? I don't think so. I think that summarizes it. So uh, we're available to answer any questions. And as far uh, as I know, Bob Roper's online. Yes, I was. This is Gail. I was just about to to say that um, Bob Roper is available for any questions if you uh, have them, and I can bring him into the meeting if you'd like. Thanks, Gail. I, I don't have any questions. That, I don't. Yeah, I have comments. I don't have comments. any questions for Mr. Roper. Yeah, okay. I have some comments. I. Okay. Any um, public public comments on this, Gail? No public comments other than Bob Roper. No one in Zoom. Yeah, I. You know, upon reflection, as um, I read through this again and listened to council comments, thought about the issues that we've been thinking about for a long time on this matter. I think one of the issues with the, that we need to define as a council is whether we want a, uh, a, wild, a wildfire uh, resiliency plan to be limited to what can be done just in the uh, Ojai city limits, or whether we're looking at uh, trying to uh, leverage our status as the only municipality in the Ojai area of interest for what needs to be done overall. Uh, I'll give one example. Uh, it's come to my attention recently that uh, we really don't have a clear uh, responsibility for maintaining fire breaks around uh, the valley, completely outside the city limits. And yet it's important uh, in terms of preventing um, uh, fires from developing a fire ecology for the entire valley that those kinds of things be maintained. I brought up the hydrants issue. Again, you want something that is uh, uh, Ojai area of interest or valley wide uh, to be in place to both help with insurability and to try to reduce the susceptibility to wildfires in terms of fire ecology. Uh, vegetation management raised up several issues on that. So I think this whole plan is our focus just on the city limits, which is very limited in what we can do if the fire ecology outside the city limits is it particularly uh, rendered us particularly susceptible, or do we, or do we want to think about uh, how we can try to uh, leverage a, a, a plan or advocate for a plan that would be adopted by not just the city's jurisdiction, by the county and the Ventura County Fire Department as well, and the fourth point I want to make along those lines is the areas of the areas of refuge. You know, are we looking at uh, the worst case scenario where people can't get out and how we handle them? Or are we going to have any sort of 
um, premise or expectation that we're going to be able to uh, evacuate. In my opinion, uh, evacuation only without sufficient area of refuge capacity um, is, is itself a recipe for great risk. So I guess I'm, I'm just trying to see this focus is very good in terms of city of Ojai. And I'm just wondering whether or not we want to um, think about uh, whether we should be looking at a plan that is um, our recommendation as a city for the entire fire ecology that we're embedded with within the OI, uh, the greater Ohio Valley. And I just, I wanna raise that as an overall issue. Bob, can you respond to that? Gail, can you find Bob? Um, yeah. he, there he is. Yeah, Bob, there we is. can hear you if you wanna go ahead and speak. Okay. Bob. I, I heard the comments and uh, the councilman is absolutely correct, is that the wildfire problem is much larger than the city. All what I did is offer you what you only what you have direct control over for action. I truly agree that anything else that deals with the valley wide is a much larger discussion that does need to be addressed with the county as a whole. Uh, and which includes the fire department, the sheriff's department, and so forth, because the fire doesn't respect jurisdictional lines and nor should a plan. But what the city can do is what's offered in what's before you tonight. Um, but I, I fully support that it, this does need to go beyond the city limits and include the valley. Randy, and then we do have one public comment. Kind of like. Okay, uh, Michael Light, please. Hi. Um, yes, I want to uh, agree with Bob and another city council member um, tonight. I think it's an excellent idea that the city leverage their, um, uh, let's say, um, well, I can't remember um, the word, but uh, like like Bob just said, fire uh, starts over there and then comes here. And while we are surrounded by wild land that's not within city limits, if the city will continue to take specific actions, such as continuing to fund the uh, Ojai Valley Fire Safe Council, which uh, can themselves execute a lot of the items in the wildfire resiliency plan. Um, I believe the plan calls for an, an entity to kind of rein in all of the um, action items and delegate or execute them. And I think that um, it was an excellent decision of the council to fund the uh, fire safe council this season and and any other um, um, uh, plans or or reports that will benefit the city of Ojai but may take place or or involve other uh, entities around the city that don't necessarily fall within our limits um, we we are all working together here. And obviously this is a, a very, very um, important issue. Uh, and it's getting late. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, Randy? So, um, you know, there's there's um, two concerns here. And um, Mr. Roper's led us on to the discussion that is the first one, which is in-house. And Mr. Councilman Weirich has brought up um, the outhouse. <laughs> you like that one? Huh? I like that. <laughs> but but the interesting That's thing pretty is, I would call them short term, long term, because the short term is what we're here as a council, and that's to deal with what we can we immediately deal with internally, and the long term is um, the bureaucratic dance that we would have to perform to get the county and all those other entities to join us in this dance mm -hmm. of saving our community. Yeah. So one's a real long-term and one's a real short-term. Um, I think 
tonight, I'd like to um, focus more on the short term. And and my uh, some of my comments to the short term are, um, we talked about um, taking this plan and implementing it, yet we don't really have a person to implement it. Uh, my thought would be for any plan that works in a community like ours has to start from the bottom up. It can't come from the top down. It can't, it, I, I think it has to be volunteer based. Um, it can't, you know, and, and, unless it has to be paid for. But I would think that someone who's volunteering to lead the charge on creating this plan for the community along these guidelines that, that uh, you guys have put together. Um, I think that to me, that's the first step is finding those individuals that want to come together um, and do this. So one of the suggestions I'd like to make tonight is maybe each council member um, make some recommendations as to some people that might be good at that. And um, because um, uh, Mayor uh, Sticks and, and Councilman Wyrick have been on this council, maybe you go through the interview process with these candidates and pick a leader. And through that process, we will have gathered probably if each of us turn in two or three or four, 15 or 20 people in the community that we feel would be really exceptional to help be this volunteer group. Um, and then let that leader choose between those folks and create his team or her team. Um, but I think we need to start from that. I, I, I don't know if a paid position is what we want. I think we need this community to come together and recognize that with, without them being involved, Nothing's going to happen. We did the same thing four years ago. We drafted the same report four years ago. And here we are back four years later, and we haven't implemented a thing. Uh, well, I'm not going to say that. There are some things that we have done, um, but not created the, the, the things that really would make us resilient. The other thing I think we're lacking, um, and I think Councilman Wyrick touched on this, is um, we always talk about the exodus out of the valley in the event of a fire or a catastrophic event, when the reality is um, staying in a safe place might be more beneficial for us. In the past, we've all gone to Nordoff High School. Uh, that was probably one of my bigger arguments with the ATP was the fact that that's our safe zone. The reality is if we looked at this community and we looked at the open space, we've got Soul Park, we've got the golf course, We've got all of the public schools, um, yet we haven't seen any invitation sent to um, Ojai Unified School District regarding being a part of this solution. Um, I have a sense that with, with their monies, they could buy a, uh, um, a 40, an eight by 40 utility shed and put it on every, every uh, school site and the city could figure out how to fund it with blankets um, water and all of the things that are necessary for the community to have in the event of a catastrophic event. We keep talking fire because fire is the closest thing that's hurt us. The reality in California, earthquakes are probably more devastating and probably greater to happen. Um, you know, that's either or. But that's my sense here. We've got a, we've got a, a good foundation here. We've got some great recommendations. Um, but we need a leader or leaders, and I think it has to come from the community. Um, because if we're going to lead it, it's going to get caught up in the bureaucratic thing that happens with everything that we do. Um, if it's a volunteer-based group, they can move at will. Um, you know, they can um, report back to council as needed, but pretty much... They can run with this, so that's where I, that's where I'm at right now. Is I think this rec I think these recommendations are great. I think there's more that could come from it. I think that we need to include more open space in the discussion, um, and I think we need to involve the school board because they're a big part of our internal environment. Um, so I'll let someone else speak. Wait, wait. Um, I have a question. Yeah, we just got a public comment from. I'm not sure what it's Pucci. Doogie. Oh, okay. I know you, Doogie. 
Hello, my name is Doogie, as you might know. Hello, Bob. <laughs> Hello, Doogie. You know me. I do. Okay, did you want to talk to him about Red Cross or you want me to? You say again. Bob, did you want to talk about Red Cross or you want me? Go ahead, Doogie. Okay. Uh, Red Cross, as much as you know, or not cannot actually mobilize ourselves. We come from the fire department. They make the decision. Another person here that ran Red Cross at that time was Dale. Now, what we do is we have it set up for Red Cross. We do have certs, AM radio, and Red Cross. We call ourselves triads. That's probably the sheriff knows. The thing is, is that when we are things come down, a volunteer, we get the call. Nordoff is our main place to go, but we can go to any other place that is noted, as was said, Soul Park, the other schools, anywhere in the valley. The thing is, Bob's right, Randy's right, keep it out of sea. Thomas Fire hit the property of Ojai, came in and touched it, but it was put out very quick, but it still got into Ojai Sea. But getting on the Red Cross, they had the agenda and can resources to do that. Water, food, and personnel to do that that are trained in Ojai. Bob is part of that situation too. Are you still on that committee, Bob? No. Okay. Did not know that. Anyway, that being said, we do have Red Cross here. And as for volunteers, there's things coming in about that there are going to be things coming for the volunteers to try and work with other organizations, the Rotary, Optimus, Lions, the VFW, the American Legion, you got powers there. Even though the uh, military guys, they can take orders, they can do radio, they can do things. You're lucky here being in, being in Ojai because our ham radios are huge. Over 285, we got more ham radios than anybody else, communications. And that is good. That's all I have to say. But the thing is, yes, volunteers are super important. Without that, that's the backbone of the city. That is the holders. That's all I have to say. Any questions? Anybody have a question for me? Uh, maybe I do. Go ahead. Um, you know, and, and, and the mayor sticks. Remember that, that day that we had the that event in the park, it seems like we already had all these volunteers. You know, the, the, you mentioned some of the organizations. I mean, we, it's not like we have to take untrained people. They're already trained. We can get more people, but we have, there must be someone already that could lead the charge and train other people. There will can be. The sheriffs were really great at that time during the Thomas fire. They were doing taxi service, bringing people into Nordoff. Mm -hmm. Now, Nordoff had a problem with it because they had an atmosphere problem because it was going out there. And the guys from Fresno, because we had a lot of organizations here from their fire departments, they came from Fresno all around the state. Their idea, if things got real bad at Nordoff for the high school, they were going to take us out in the baseball fields and circle us with their, with their trucks and spray us with water, hypothermia instead, trying to protect the building. I thought that was really strange. I never heard that before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had a few talks about with, uh, with them about that. Hypothermia would have been, yeah, rain. Native trucks don't hold a lot. But on that, just said, uh, during that fire, the, the hospital had some uh, three fire engines around. Nordoff had two fire engines around for protection. At that late that night, they brought in more, but we had our circle of fire around us. Yeah. Is that answer? Did I answer any for you, Susa? Uh, you, you said more than I asked for. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Any other questions? No, it's fine. It's good. Okay. I'll get the pull and pull me off. Thank you, Duchi. Much appreciated. Uh, Bob, do you want to respond to any of Randy's comments? You know, I think what the proposal for the council to consider tonight is this is strictly just a roadmap. There's a lot of work 
that still needs to be done. I think if the council was to um, agree, approve the roadmap, then um, Mr. Vega um, and the volunteers or group then can take that, follow it, develop the exact project, the exact cost, look at alternative methods and funding and come back with specific projects one by one, but at least you're following the roadmap that you've uh, given approval for. Right, yeah, and I would agree with that. And just a reminder, Bob is the retired county chief and the, head, the chair of the California Fire Safe Council. So, and Bob has so kindly um, volunteered to help us implement it once it passes. So, um, yeah, to speak to your question or comment, Randy, you know, yes, definitely. And, and, you know, I'd be happy to work with Bill or whomever to get some volunteers going. Could I, uh, my mayor, uh, Mr. Roper, I was wondering, I have one specific thing I was wondering about adding to the 13 points. And again, we're not committing you anything. It's a roadmap, as you say. Uh, by by doing this, um, in other words, for talking about hiring contractor, that's evaluating, not committing to it, as I understand it, because I think there, that's a big issue as well. But in terms of a, of, of a number fourteen, what would you think about something very simple in terms of at least inside the city, adopt the uh, uh, standards for fire hydrants, um, maintenance and repair and testing, and uh, possible water supply hardening measures uh, that the city does have maybe have some control over in terms of feeding those fire hydrants, maintaining pressure in them. Oh, I, I can support that. And, and now we'll just show the city's um, follow through on past problems as you work with Casitas to get that work done. So yeah. uh, I could support that action. All right. <laughs> I just before too much time goes by and I forget, I just wanted to respond to Randy's concern again about the ATP and remind everyone that all four lanes will be open during an emergency. I think that's very important and the city manager can verify that during an emergency, we can open up the lanes and have plenty of room for um, either the fire trucks park if they need to park there, correct? Or if, I mean, there's there. With, with the demonstration project, we've tested uh, so that to ensure that the fire trucks have access to use the, what is it now the bike lanes. Yes. So there'd be, uh, those two lanes would be available in an emergency. So, yeah. so I just want to clarify also, uh, you don't have to defend yourself. With no, but you brought it up. No, hear me you out. brought it up. You don't, you don't have to defend don't. yourself. I'm not. You, we I'm tried not. these fire trucks in a non-emergency situation. When the shit is hitting the fan around this community and we're burning down, that's when you want to assess, uh, is there access? And, and furthermore, we don't have a design on that highway yet. We're still in the process. So all I was alluding to is the fact that high school right now is our central location and the fact that we need to diversify from one location in this valley for the betterment of this community. So um, the thing I wanted to talk to Mayor was on, a, a, so we're gonna vote tonight on passing these 14. Um, well, so when we reach that point, that's what we're trying to do is vote on these 14, the roadmap, but we don't have, we don't know who's driving us yet. So are we going to take that back to staff and have staff make a recommendation? Um, or what are we doing here with that aspect of it? Well, James, you want to add? Well, I'll just say, uh, uh, I'm always driving it, whether I like it or not. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah. so to speak to that, uh, I'll, I'll be driving it for now. But as part of that, the next step would be coming back to council with a funding plan with recommendations for which of these to fund and, and in what ways to do that. So that would be part of the next steps. And you're an amazing driver, James. Yeah. So thank you for doing you that. Um, yes. Well, are we ready for a motion? Yeah, I, um, I would move to direct staff to implement this plan. Um, I would 
including 14 fire hydrant standards? Okay, thank you. Including uh, each council member suggesting uh, uh, to the city manager a group of individuals that they might think could help lead us. Great. From a volunteer basis. Beautiful. Um, I, I just want to say I'd rather not pass a crappy plan. And I think this is not a fully vetted, fully ready to rock and roll plan. Um, it's missing a number of things. Fire hydrants aren't as simple as just saying we're going to enforce fire hydrants. This doesn't specifically in any of these first 13 or what would be 14 include some of the important things that I brought up last time. I appreciate that we're addressing some of those things that I mentioned last time, but we, this doesn't include Soul Park. This doesn't include what I call bug in positions where we have traffic. This doesn't include anything about gas rationing. This doesn't include the litany of things that I personally experienced. That was the feedback we got from the community during the Thomas fire. And it also is so focused on fire, it eliminates I know it, I know that one of the answers to one of the questions was that it works for other emergencies, but I do not think this is a plan that I want to see funding and have questions about. I think this plan needs to be much better developed and uh, I think there's a lot of things that are missing. So um, I'm not in favor of moving forward with this until it's done right. And until it's done right, uh, I don't, there's no point in trying to figure out how to fund it. Uh, Bob, do you have any response to that? So no, I respect the councilman's opinion and I'll follow the direction that you guys choose tonight. Okay, well, we have a motion. David. Well, I need some clarification. Uh -oh. um, I understand what Bob's role is. I don't know why we're deferring him to so much when this is council making this decision. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is, um, uh, I know that you two sit on the same council as him and the city manager, am I correct? And I believe Chris Stanch, am I correct? The disaster council. So um, he is speaking for all of you when he speaks? No. no. Okay, so um, I would like to preclude him from any more part of the discussion, close it, and then come back to the deliberation um, before we vote on on. Uh, uh, I'd like to add to that this this does not add any coordination between us and the county, which is the most essential part for specifically dealing with the. Fall. I am on fire. <laughs> three for three. That's three for three. three for, uh, and if you can't hear at home, that's the uh, that's the bell tower again. Psychic thing here, Ryan. Um, yeah. Have I been talking for three hours already? Yeah. Um, the uh, the the reality is that this doesn't include. I, I mean, I think we. I don't need. We don't need volunteers. We need a aggressive ad hoc either committee or group of council members or elected officials who are going to coordinate with the county or as a whole group as a council and for you know force them to work with us to get the things that are done we are the center of the donut and if the donut's burning it's not going to matter what's happening in the center and the and soul park for example are all county properties and if we're not working with the county and this doesn't include some coordinated effort to try and work with the county and get these issues done it doesn't make sense to me. And, and that's why the, I'm not kidding. The first thing I did when I got on the council uh, was asked to set up a meeting with OES and sit down and actually talk with them. And I think that's what we need a continuation of. I think writing down these things are great, but none of these things take care of what I see are the, you know, the most important, significant issues that we've got to have in place. And um, well, I've spoke with OES, uh, you know, the, the, the head of, um, about Soul Park, it's not included in any of their plans. It's a very concerning thing. It's like, oh, just call us, we'll open it up. But I haven't seen it written down. James knows it's on the, as I call it, the secret whiteboard in an emergency where we have all the stuff we wanna do regardless of what anybody tells us because we're gonna do whatever we gotta do in an emergency. Um, if we're formalizing this, this does not go nearly that far. And uh, the, the standards for um, fire hydrants are included. They're already part of Casitas's program. So no, they're not adopted according to outside reference standards. The AWA standards are, as far as I'm they're aware, not doing annual testing in March. No, no, they're not performing them, but the standards are. Already they're not. Perfect. They're not adhering. To Holding the them accountable for it is different than that. Making sure they pass. I, but I, but I do want to make sure we do, we do what that. we can, at least within the city limits on that. Right. Well, we right. we have a. I I completely agree, and I think that's a really important part of it. And I know that in the past, other water purveyors in this in the city, until we held them accountable for it, we didn't get anything. So I think that's an imperative part, but just asking them to adopt those standards is a lot different than asking them to forcing them to 
actually perform those standards. I think that's an important distinction. I agree. Yeah. All right. Um, Susan and Randy, did you want to that may, the intent was to try to get them to adhere to it. You can't, you know, this is, we keep kicking everything down the road. It's just like with the tiny houses. Why can't we add the essential things that if we agree with Ryan, what's missing, why can't we add that to your motion and so that we can approve this? Yeah, um, yeah I would agree with that. And to quote Eisenhower, planning is essential and plans are useless. So we know that we'll, we'll make a good plan and then it's gonna change. You know, especially in the world in which we live in today. So, and and James. Hey, when it's a good plan, me. I'll vote for it. Yeah, but this is what um, you did last time. I'm going to finish. I'm, I'm going to finish, you guys. Um, James, we you are already implementing some of these, correct? Yeah, I think seven of these we've been implementing. Um, you know, and I can just briefly list a couple. The building code updates. The BAB is currently reviewing them and finishing that review on September 1st. Um, we've got. Uh, the disaster council had asked us to investigate the sign boards and the city council had reviewed that back a couple years ago so we 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 actually recently got a quote for those sign boards um we've grown the eoc function bought new uh, software such as the my ohi apps uh, our application which we sent a notice out today uh and, and i'll bring that up today too um using facebook and text messages as needed uh we have um um there was a couple more uh we had the disaster council approve uh this plan and forward it to the council we conducted the first emergency preparation day on may 27th um and so those are the ones that we've that are in progress so uh there's several on here that aren't in progress yet and so if we adopt these we'd start working on those but those are the those are the ones we've we've implemented okay thank you and and your and the plan is in six months you plan to hire someone who will can you talk a little bit about that yeah uh just as far as when we evaluate you know options for whether to hire a contractor whether whether to use internal staffing i think the challenge that we've seen over the last 18 months or actually we always uh, it keeps expanding 19 months or whatever it's been uh since covid is that we pared down staffing to survive the budget impacts of COVID, and now we're finally kind of coming back. So uh, admittedly, the process on implementing these was slowed down by that, um, uh, but I think we've made good progress, all things considered. And so as we continue to staff back, one of the positions that the city council had approved right before COVID uh, was the um, em events coordinator, or events and public information coordinator, coordinator which would be a position that potentially would be responsible for both public workshops and then also for the emergency notifications, which are critical to this. So that would be one of our lead positions on these. So. Okay. Thank you. So we could get to work on the home hardening right away once the BAB approves it. And, and one sentence I heard recently, this was in a, an LA Times article, work from the home out, not from the forest in. So all of us need to take responsibility and start right at home now. Uh, Randy? So uh, I think, uh, I, I agree with Councilman Blatz that um, if we're voting on a plan, this is not a well-written, well, this is not a complete plan. So I'm trying to think of another word for plan that we that we could adopt tonight, because I'm for I, I want to move forward, and the thing that just scared me is I just heard someone say six months. You realize in six months where we're going to be in this community regarding fire? Well, the we, I'm I'm just saying six months. We need six days. We need six weeks. We need something faster. So by saying that, I'm just, that's all I'm trying to say. So how, how do, what's a better word for plan? What's the OHI's wildfire resiliency guidelines? It's not a plan now, it's guidelines. Is that a better word? Is that a better way to move this forward? Because whoever we put in charge of this is the one that's going to adopt these and adopt all of the additional information that we provide them and that they gather. Then they'll come back with a plan. But right now, I, I think that sounds better, and I would and I would go along with, with that. Bill, it's fine. Ryan? Yep. I, I think I think part of the problem is there should be an evacuation plan. There should be a where we go plan. There should be a communication plan. That this is this is an 
having an all encompassing disaster plan is missing that the fundamental elements of it are broken down into, 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 into parts that we need to do better on. And that I feel like we learned better from the Thomas fire on and that in each one of those areas, it's the framework for the start of a plan, but it doesn't have all of the elements fully out there. I mean, in the fire hardening, the fire hydrants, all the, there's prevention, there's evacuation. There's, I, I, I prefer to call it, there's the, everybody knows what a bug out bag is nowadays. I assume that's where you're, you know, you got to leave an emergency, but there's the bug in situation where you don't know if you have an evacuation route, you don't know the places you can go and you know, you need to be safe. I think it needs to be tailored more to those elements than than 14 or 13 or however many we're going to end up with just general principles, but different categorical areas. And I'd like to see how these correspond with the county, because some of these things, you know, this isn't a plan. And, and, and Randy, you said this, you know, and, and there's a great scene in one of my favorite movies, um, uh, Crimson Tide. And the the chef in there is having a heart attack and gene hackman declares a that they're going to do a, a a missile test right then and at the end denzel washington asks him, why would you do a missile test when we had a medical emergency and he said because things don't happen when everything's going great these types of things happen when everything's going wrong and we need something that we know is buttoned up that the staff can be looking at the council members can be looking at that when that moment occurs the roles are are clear the, the delineations are clear and functionally we have elements we can tell the public about evacuation. We know we've done our prevention. We know we have now communication and then we have, um, uh, you know, uh, ongoing responsibilities that that some are going to have to be on the fly that are more art than science and can't be planned perfectly because in an emergency, obviously, you can't plan everything out that's going to happen. That that to me is the level of plan we need and we need it to integrate directly with the county. So that when that moment comes, because the notice doesn't come to the city, the notice comes to the outlying unincorporated areas first, and they're the ones who have to evacuate or deal with things. If not, then then it's a valley wide disaster that happens instantaneously, like a earthquake. And we have got to know. And I know one of the problems that happened in the council is that nobody understood their roles. This doesn't address as, as clear. I know it, it was a, a point in, in something I read, but it, it's not clear. Like I can't read this and go, OK there's a fire coming down. I know what my role is. I know what I can do. If I'm safe and I'm healthy, how can I be involved in helping this? I, I look at this and go, this wouldn't change a thing I did in the last fire. This wouldn't change anything I was certain the city was doing in the last fire. Th this, this wouldn't. Um, other than getting the prevention stuff taken care of. But we we did the fire hydrant checkup a year and a half before the Thomas fire. I did it myself. I mean, I helped force it myself. We did. Uh, the evacuation was a complete mess. Nobody knew where to go. Nobody, nobody knew. Uh, this doesn't address that there were 45 cars at Chevron trying to get gas to get out of town at the same time. That was the emergency. Where are these things we learned and, and how do we break them up so we can talk about it and figure out how we're going to implement them, whether it's through our own police force, whether it's through the fire department, whether it's through the county emergency response and being able to tell them these are the things we're requiring out of you when this happens. Um, I have no problem with this being a framework of an idea of a plan. And that's where it's at. But this isn't the plan. If this is the best plan we can come up with, I can't vote for it. Well, that's why I moved the word plan. We can do that. And, and then I even crossed right. out guideline and I put starting point. Um, so, I'm sorry, Mayor. I, I crossed out, I put cross out plan first, then I went, well, guidelines not winning the day. So maybe we call it the starting point. I think what we're all trying to say here, Ryan, is we're all in complete agreement with what you're saying. You made a lot of sense at the last council session when you brought this up the way you did. You're making just as much sense tonight, but we got to move forward. And this is this is a small step. It's not the step you're looking for. I agree. I agree. But it's a small step, and, and we need to take it. And one, one other thing I want to bring up, because I forget this, the, the number of, of large animal movement uh, trailers and other things that were blocking roads Absolutely. and we're going other places, we need to make sure that the big parking lots are available for that. I, I don't I don't know how that works. I don't have the, the information, but I know I saw trailers that were incredibly long, 40 feet long, that were blocking roads and they were trying to get gas and they're trying to get out of town. 
is there a way that they can maintain a spot at, at Soul Park in the parking lot or another place? If that's not going to work, that's what's then not can being we, recognized by we, OES right now. Right. Can we prioritize exactly. their exit of the valley? I mean, you know, well, how do we start, Ryan? I, I'm with you. I'm just saying that these are the other. Okay. I want to make sure I'm getting them on the record. So if these are yeah. the things we need to so, look at. So how do we start? I mean, write what you, all these things you're saying, write them down. OK, well, I mean, we were, you know, I mean, write them down. Uh Submit them. I mean, get them in the mix. I met with know? OES as soon as I got here and put them all on the list. Well, <laughs> all right. So what Senator, do we want to name this tonight? So do it we again. We do. Thing. Excuse me. One, we have one more public comment. Are you all okay with that? <laughs> Julia? Okay. Thank you. So you guys keep on talking about someone to head up this plan, like a volunteer. And I was just wondering if you guys know about the Fire Safe Council you're aware of that very aware do you know what they do they do this stuff yeah so i just i just wanted to know if you had any comments oh, they're in the about mix. that they're in they the are. Mix. okay Definitely. all right good to know thank you okay so how can we signal the first step without being uh fatally definitive and therefore self-limiting oh, i think it's a well, uh, we've suggested calling it not a plan but guidelines resiliency right. guidelines or even the word guide well, it's, a, it's a starting well, point i'm not trying to to what word degrade it into let's, worthlessness let's, let's get to a word what, what, what it's a framework for framework, resiliency it's a framework, framework for the beginning of a plan of a, of a wildfire, pure imagine. how about OFA wildfire resiliency framework that's that's fine i mean i'm, I'm the semantics of it don't don't cheer me up at all Nobody but, likes uh, that word. but i'm okay with that <laughs> wait a second you're removing my word no framework I, i'd go with framework that's let's, fine. Just, I mean, let's I, get it done framework I, my, my only point is that i don't want i don't Sorry. want us to get to a point where we're indicating that this is not the end near, near even this even this is far, near the end it's, it's not done it's a, that it's a final draft right. or even a preliminary draft organizing a path to follow and, a lot and more. i greatly appreciate that we've moved it okay. this far we, we're not at the goal line yet but we got the ball we're moving down the field and that's a really good thing okay. and i'm right. really glad we're bringing this up and we haven't fumbled and, it and we Let's haven't fumbled contribute it contribute our specific ideas into the mix I, I'm, in I, writing I, okay I, I will i will gladly reiterate every i i had a lengthy list when i met with oes i'm happy to bring it up again well you're on tape okay. second second well no we, 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 so we have a motion right but yeah. i want a framework yes okay good and do we have a second second Okay, great. Uh, roll call, please, Gail. Mayor Pro Tem Wyrick. Yes. Mayor Stix. Yes. Councilmember Haney. Yes. Councilmember Francina. Yes. Councilmember Blatz. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Okay, hike. <laughs> <laughs> what, huh? Huh? Run with it. <laughs> Baby step. Agreed. Baby step. All right, moving on. All right, moving on uh, to number five. It's the designation of voting delegate and alternates for the League of California Cities annual conference at the Sacramento Convention Center, September 22nd to 24th. I nominate the mayor. I second that. <laughs> yeah. I. Yeah, that's your job. I've, I've done it. When's the last time you were in Sacramento? <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's not a bad flight from Santa Barbara. You'll enjoy the convention. It really is interesting. Okay. I'd love to. Thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> Moving on. Although maybe I'm soon. Does this we require a, a motion or yeah. does this, does this require a motion or a vote? It does. We need to vote uh, because the mayor would be exercising the city's uh, voting authority with the league. And and then is we want to set an alternate as well. Oh, yeah, I I nominate Susan as the alternate. No, that's the mayor pro Tim's job. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> there, huh? well, I'll a, make a well first of all do we know yet if it requires going to sacramento so at this time we actually assumed they were going to do virtual so we called them and they have no plans to, to offer virtual at this time uh, this? It, it's know, a moving i target. have an excuse I, I may have to move those are the most confusing answers. But there's ever. two alternates. And no virtual plans. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've already been to one of these. Now, some of y'all have not been to one. Oh, I've okay, been okay. To my share. You've been to okay, your share. Me, Ryan, been, have you been to one? Just, I've been to the one in uh, in um, uh, Palm Springs, but I haven't been to this one. But unfortunately, these dates are not working. Okay. okay. Susan, have you been to one of these? Yes, back way back in. Oh, no, uh, no. In your new term. <laughs> not your old I, term. I, I, come on, guys. It was, it was <laughs> things like have changed. Year. 
was a two or three day event at that mm -hmm. time. We stayed in a fancy hotel. Mm -hmm. It's three days this time. Three days. It sounds to me like you're missing out on something. I think you should go. I'm looking at the dates. I think the community would be well represented September by you two women. September 24. Yeah. Do we fly there? We'll have fun. You can drive together. Don't worry. We'll have fun. Uh, ho You'll horse have fun. and buggy okay, is an I option can't for give a final concern. answer. It, I forget what's happening on it's a, it's a, it's not a, it's maybe in there for the swearing in of our new governor. What you might, you might have uh, be right after recall. So, in case that if, if I could offer a suggestion, the council could could nominate or designate the mayor and council member Francina as delegate and alternate without deciding tonight whether you go or not to the conference. That could yeah. be made. We can have one alternate, two different decisions. Yeah. So I'll second that, Matt. Okay, I agree. Okay, <laughs> may we have the roll call, please, Gail? Wait, who, who first did? Uh, Council Member Francina. I did. Is that yeah, it, it, I first. It, it, I, 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 I'll I'll, first. It'll be Ryan and I'll second it. Okay. So this is, I don't, I'm not making a firm commitment, right? I have two dogs. I got to get a dog seat. You and Mayor right. Sticks no can figure out who's going to go. Okay. Maybe I can help you with that. I'm across the fence. I, I honestly <laughs> would go. If I, if I didn't have a water hearing, <laughs> you guys maybe that case. So close together. I would okay. Did we get a second? Okay. Can we have a roll call, please? Okay. Roll call, please, Gail. So just to be clear, uh, the, the alternate is council member Francina at this moment. Okay. Yes. Okay. So for the roll call, um, mayor sticks. Yes. Council member Haney. Yes. Mayor pro tem Weirich. Yes. Council member Blatz. Yes. Council member Francina. Didn't we already do this? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank Sacramento, you. here we come. Absolutely. Woo. Yes, indeed. Okay, Let's moving go. on. Number six. Uh, last but not least, the coronavirus emergency response. Yeah, yeah and I I do have a a brief presentation with a couple of um, slides. So you could... I'm freezing. Uh, I'll, I'll skip the. I'll skip the slides. We'll we'll do a um, we'll just do it verbally. So uh, uh, we wanted to to make sure to continue to have these uh, coronavirus updates, especially. I think um, people are aware where we are in a in the midst of a, a surge, uh, both locally and and uh, nationally. Uh, locally, uh, I think at the last meeting we talked about going from only a couple of cases every 14 days to going up to 16 cases in 14 days at that time. Uh, the latest results show uh, for the 93023 zip code, um, which includes Ojai, but also uh, additional um, area in the valley, we are up to 39 cases in the past 14 days. So the, that, that number has increased pretty significantly um, uh, since that time. It's not to the level that it uh, was in January of 2021, but it's definitely uh, an increase from the last couple of months. Uh, we talk, we've talked about the case rate not being the end all be all statistic, um, uh, talking to the county, talking to uh, the public health department, uh, two, two metrics that they look at closely are the hospitalization, number of hospitalizations and the number of uh, people currently in the ICU. And so just to give an idea, uh, today there are 147 people hospitalized in Ventura County due to COVID. That number was 70 uh, at the beginning of the month. So it's almost, it's doubled in, in about a month. It was 23 in July. It was nine in June, two in May. So you can see how, how low that number had gotten and how it's increased since then. However, it, uh, was 449 in January and in the 200s in both December and February. So we haven't gotten back to that level that uh, of the surge from December to February, but the um, it is definitely an increase from May, May, May and June of this year. Similarly, our ICU uh, count at this time in the in the county is 34. Uh, that was 18 at the beginning of the month. So it's almost doubled. It was six in July and two in June. So that's another case where the numbers had really gotten low and they've they've started to come back up. Uh, again, at the highest point though, uh, we're, uh, we were at 89 in January and in the uh, 60s in December and February. So we're at 34 now, we're about half, half uh, or a little less than half what we were at those spikes. But uh, obviously, 
none of us want to see that trend going up, which is what we're seeing right now. So, uh, so in light of that, I'm sure everybody's heard, and I mentioned earlier, we we posted and we sent out through the My Ohio app today uh, an update that the county of uh, the county public health. Uh, department has issued the new health order requiring masking indoors in indoor public places, which includes grocery stores, uh, workplaces, retail stores, restaurants, and theaters. Included in that is the uh, city of Ho Ojai's facilities. So we've put, put um, uh, copies of the uh, mask required signage and we've um, made masks available at all our, our public facilities. Uh, but uh, I, we also wanted to note that we, uh, we've we been um, making sure to go out and do education and outreach over the last couple of days. Uh, we've handed, uh, we've had um, staff go business to business and have handed out 86 uh, flyers to 86 businesses. Uh, it's interesting because I asked the, the staff that have gone out, you know, what the reaction is. And, um, you know, and, and I think right now everybody has seen that, you know, opinions on, on the masking, you know, are kind of uh, varied, but um, the general reaction from the businesses has been uh, that they uh, appreciate the, um, the signage, but they actually ask for additional signage because they want to make sure to put post it everywhere, you know, to kind of let everybody know you know, that they're requiring those masks inside businesses. So it feels like at this point, we're getting a, uh, a pretty um, positive reaction from businesses who don't are, you know, who want to make sure that they're, um, they're following those requirements. So, so we're only on day two, I think of the order. I think he announced, uh, Dr. Levin announced it on Friday, but it actually went into effect uh, like at midnight on, on uh, uh, our 1159 on, on uh, Monday. So um, we haven't seen a whole lot of activity yet, but we're we're sending staff out with those flyers. We're putting those flyer, uh, putting back out the hand sanitizing stations, putting back out um, the um, uh, uh, signage that that uh, that people may recall that is posted in various locations throughout the city. So so that's kind of where we're at in the last few days. Um, uh, we also wanted to just uh, announce we've been having testing at Sarzati Park on Wednesdays and Fridays uh, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, we actually worked with uh, the county and COVID clinic to get an additional day of testing. Uh, so starting um, starting next Monday, August 30th, there will be testing Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays at Sarzati Park. Uh, we also were able to work with both of them. We've heard some of the concerns and, and some of the different um, issues. So we were able to work with both of them to, to get uh, some increased staffing at the testing site. So that should hopefully help. Uh, both of those things should hopefully help cut down some of the long lines we were seeing. Uh, and just to give an idea of the usage of those testing sites, at one point during COVID, uh, they were going to go down to one day because we had like six people show up on a, on one of the Wednesdays. Uh, we are uh, where as last week on Wednesday, we had 76 people show up for testing and on Wednesday and 86 people show up for testing on Friday. So we're seeing that correlation of more and more people are showing up for testing. So uh, hopefully the uh, Mondays being added and the staffing increase will help um, keep those lines shorter and make it a smoother experience. And so um, if you are going to use the testing, one recommendation, and I learned this myself uh, when I went to get tested, is uh, pre-register. Uh, they welcome walk-ups, but it's definitely an easier process if you pre-register at uh, covidclinic.org. And you can go to actually covidclinic.org slash Sarzati Park, and that'll get you right to the, um, the location to sign up for our site. Um, so with that, that's just kind of an, uh, an update. Um, we, uh, uh, I believe the mask order is in effect until September 19th. Uh, so um, at this time, you know, we expect the next month or so that that will be in place and we'll make sure to announce when anything changes. So. Thank you, James. Questions? Um, Mayor. James, are the uh, um, we're required to wear a mask when we go indoors. Are the workers of all these establishments all supposed to be wearing masks? Uh, 
Yes, they uh, under this requirement, they should be wearing masks. I've, I've been to a couple of stores and that's not what I'm observing. Mm -hmm. The um, the other as aspect of it is, is uh, do you have a sense that, uh, uh, you know, we were the first to mask in the county. Um, and I think that that, that really um, was, a, was a big saving point for our community. And it seems like, um, it seems like we need to think about uh, about any other steps that we may want to take regarding uh, requirements of people to be tested or requirements of people to actually um, uh, have taken a shot, especially the new one that's coming out. Um, I'm not sure where the rest of you are on that. And like Bill and I, we disagree a lot on it, which is fine. That's what we're allowed to. But um, one of the things that saved us was being proactive and not waiting. And I just think it's important that, um, especially council and public figures um, lead. Um, so I'm hoping that we all are, I'm hoping that we're all safe. Um, and I'm thinking, and I'm hoping that we're, we're preparing um, for this to get worse versus it to get um, uh, less worse. So that's just my comment. Any other questions? I had a question. Yeah. Uh, James, you and I have just, we had a little preliminary discussion on this. There's an evolution in testing going on. Uh, the, a lot of jurisdictions, a lot of countries uh, are moving away from the uh, PCR. I think even CDC is mentioning that they're going to be moving away from PCR and to the uh, rapid uh, antigen tests, which is more uh, in some, at least, I, I, look, I don't know everything about it, but I read about it. And there's assertions that you have, uh, it's it's more uh, indic indicative of actual symptomatic uh, status uh, than, uh, than than PCR can be, uh, depending upon the number of cycles that are specified in the PCR. Is there any talk in the county or any thought in the city of whether they might wanna supplement with the rapid antigen test, which actually would allow within a few minutes, everybody in a certain setting to be tested? Mm -hmm. There hasn't uh, been any talk on that, but we can follow up with uh, both the county. about the feasibility and cost mm -hmm. of we can follow up. antigen testing. We can follow up on that. I th actually think COVID clinic does offer it, but we can follow up with, uh, you know, figuring out if that's a chain. We I, can I, make that change. I just, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be for something like that. I, 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 I'll look into it. That's I think anything that we can do to, to help this community a bit. I think the most important thing we need to remember is we have a lot of people that outside of our community that come here. You know, we are, we're a tourist based economy. Well, we have a lot of, we have a, we, anything and everything that we can do. That's why I'm in agreement with you. Yeah, literally. Anything and everything that we yeah. can do to keep our community safe is, is what we need to look at. I agree with you hundred percent. Yeah. Literally, literally you could have a, uh, a, we're talking 10 to 15 minutes, I think. Right. So you could actually have it as part of the, uh, the entry screening into a public event. So, so, so anyway, someone said they were doing that on cruise lines or trying to implement that on cruise yeah. lines so that you, and tested before you went on board and other countries are doing this more of a standard than the pcr which has that long delay built into it so anyway i just thought i'd bring it up good idea good times very research it any other questions okay any public com <laughs> public comments on this item gail on item seven no okay thank you uh, oh yeah that's seven um all right well moving on to uh council member reports in light of Sousa freezing, I don't know. Uh, uh, city manager's report? Just uh, two things quickly. One is that the County of Ventura has started their redistricting process, um, and they are going to have their first meeting on August 31st from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and, uh, and then they have a series of workshops September 2nd. They'll have one September 9th, September 11th, September 13th. So um, that's, I think, important for the community uh, to know, and, and uh, we encourage people to get involved, just like we'll encourage people to get involved when ours begins, which right now is scheduled for September 14th or 14th or 18th, whichever the Tuesday is. 14th. 14th. Um, James, have we designated anyone from staff to actually attend? So uh, yeah, I'm planning to attend the first one because there there is a lot of questions about how Ohio will be impacted. So. So we'll attend that, and then um, and then September fourteenth we'll kick off ours as well. So. James, can I just say it? I mean, there's I, I've been contacted and heard from various people that the county, even though uh, CEO Mike Powers denied it, 
that there is a indication that the county is considering moving district one significantly and moving out Ojai potentially out of it and rearranging it to a significant change that would have potential significant political impacts on our community with the uh, on our area with the public uh, with the county supervisors so i just want to make sure that all the council members totally understand what's going on understand what the implications could be it may or may not be that that's a rumor but i have it from a highly credible source who contacted me and wanted to make sure that our council was well aware of it that our community was well aware of it and that if necessary we're mobilizing because there could be not necessarily we haven't confirmed what's going on but there there could be some um interesting moves that are being made that could have some significant implications for us and uh, these redistricting things don't happen very often and when they do um there can be long-term effects that are significant for little towns like ours so i just want to make sure it's on everybody's radar and if anybody has any questions follow up with james or feel free to let me you know give me a call but this is one where we need all hands on deck and if we find out quickly we may need to get super involved as a community and as a council yep well we are already considered the, the step children of the county no reason to be relegated to the step children locked in the closet <laughs> we got we got to think through this one yes thank you ryan thanks randy um any future agenda items randy um, I would again like to bring back um, the, the council protocols, um, specifically how we agendize things. I still think that uh, I strongly believe that we need to set the agenda in council with a majority and that we remove this two council and one council um, aspect of throwing stuff on our agenda. I think that we would work better, work more smoothly, and I'll save my argument for that, uh, that night. Do I need a do I need a second? I I, I second that. Okay. I agree. I think it's worth reviewing. Great. Um, I'd like to put back the talk about the start time because we did change the code at, to six thirty. Change the start time to six thirty, and then we went back because of the heat. So, if we you know we did since we changed it, it should be six thirty. Right? Well, we, we voted to change the time. Yeah, we, we updated the city code to say that the start time is 6.30. So I think, um, you know, we could go to, uh, council could go two ways with it. One is to decide to change the code back to seven or to keep the 6.30. So. Or even build some flexibility into the code. That's an option, yeah. Oxnard and Ventura start six all year round. That's why we're not there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, we'll talk about it the next Yeah, week. we were, I think the idea was to have an item where we, we de determine what we want the start time to be moving forward. Okay. Okay, anything else? All right, thank you very much. We're adjourned. Uh, nice job, you guys. <laughs>